Hola! Welcome to Apostolic Voice, the podcast, an extension of the long-running blog Apostolic Voice, which you can find by going to ryanafrench.com. That's R-Y-A-N-A-F-R-E-N-C-H.com. And I'm your host, Ryan French. Lately, some of you kind listeners, and I'm humbled and honored that you would listen to my profoundly feeble ramblings, some of you listeners have asked, who is Ryan French? So I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. I'm husband to the lovely Taylor and father to the beautiful Julia Lynn, who's 13, and the incredible Talmadge, who just turned 11. I've been a licensed minister for over 15 years, and I've served in full-time ministry each of those 15 years in several capacities, from youth pastor slash gopher, assistant pastor slash outreach minister to evangelist. But currently, I'm privileged to serve with my father, Dr. Talmadge French, as the associate pastor of the greatest revival church on earth, the Apostolic Tabernacle, here on the south side of Atlanta. My family and I have been here for nearly a decade now. My, how time flies when you're, when you're having fun. So there you have it in a nutshell. That's who Ryan French is. Lately, I've been asking myself, why do I do this podcast? I mean, it isn't like I've got gobs of time to do anything. Hopefully, it it isn't just to hear myself talk and stroke my own ego in some way. I know Ryan French is an incredibly opinionated guy, but my goal here isn't to beat people over the head with my opinions and theology. And after searching my scarred and battered heart, I've come to the conclusion that I really do just want to help people and give them an apostolically grounded resource for knowledge information, growth, enlightenment, revelation, and understanding. I have a passion for talking about the unspoken things that most people left leave unsaid. I have a passion for tackling issues that uh, people don't like to tackle because they're uncomfortable. And I do that because I know that in my life, I've been searching through difficult questions trying to find apostolic resources, or even just people who speak to these issues from an apostolic perspective, and often it's it's very hard. I know this goal is lofty and probably unreachable, but it does beg the question, what audience am I trying to reach? What group of people am I trying to talk to here? Preachers, pastors, preachers in the making, young people, elders, middle-aged folks, apostolics only, Christians in general? And I think the answer to that question is all of the above, which is likely another difficult goal to achieve. But this particular episode is a perfect example of the overall goal of this program and the intended wide-ranging audience of this program. Today's episode is called Buried Alive, the Gospel According to the Bible taken from the original article at ryanafrench.com of the same name. Basically, we're going to talk about how to be saved in a simplistic, unique, convicting, apostolic way. If you're a saint wanting a refresher or wanting to learn how to present the gospel to your friends and neighbors, this episode is for you. If you're a pastor wanting to approach the gospel in a theologically interesting and slightly convicting way— this is for you. And certainly, if you're someone unsure of your salvation, or if you're wondering what the Bible actually teaches, this episode is for you. If you're a young preacher, teacher in the making, this episode will enhance your knowledge and give you confidence moving forward. So without any more blabbing, let's grab our Bibles and dive into the gospel according to the Bible. Let me tell you about Anchor. It's the easiest way to make a podcast, and best of all, it's absolutely free to get started. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple, and all the other platforms as well. 
it's important because it's it's hard to get a podcast started. I've tried in the past. It's hard to get it off the ground. It can be very complicated. Anchor does a great job of making it user friendly and kind of keeping things in one place for you, which just helps you organize your thoughts. And as you get better and better at it, Anchor is just a great central location for you to have all your workflow. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. If you've been thinking about podcasting at all, download their free Anchor app. Just go to anchor.fm to get started. You can also find their app in Apple and Android devices. want to tell you very quickly before we get into the gospel according to the Bible and Buried Alive that you can financially support this programming by giving as little as 99 cents, $4.99, or even as much as $9.99 per month. You can do that by going to www.anchor.fm forward slash apostolic voice forward slash support. Again, that's anchor.fm forward slash apostolic voice forward slash support support. Also, please consider just running over to iTunes real quick and giving this podcast five stars and a quick review. It just gives us a little boost in the ratings so people can find us and know who we are and and hear what we're doing over here at Apostolic Voice of the Podcast. Okay, Buried Alive, the gospel according to the Bible. The fear of being buried alive has been around for centuries, but it was especially prevalent during the 18th and 19th centuries. The famed horror poet Edgar Allan Poe wrote nightmarishly about fantastical scenarios of people being buried alive. He did this on several occasions. The societal fear of premature burial became so prolific, it eventually led to the invention of the safety coffin, an odd contraption with a string leading up from the coffin to a tiny bell placed under the gravestone. The idea was if someone found themselves buried alive, they would ring the bell and hope someone would hear them and dig them up uh, before they before they expired. The safety coffin has been reinvented many times over the centuries, and even today, there are high-tech versions of the safety coffin, and you can buy one. It's very, very expensive, but they're out there. Interestingly and debatably, several modern expressions are derivatives of the safety coffin era. For example, out of concern that someone buried alive might ring a bell in the middle of the night, a new shift was added to church graveyards called the graveyard shift. So that's where we get our expression working the graveyard shift. We also get expressions like dead ringer and saved by the bell from that historical time frame. Thankfully, modern medicine has has done a lot to eliminate people's fears of being buried alive. However, some, some people still have irrational fears of waking up in a coffin underneath an immovable mountain of dirt. And I'll tell you the truth, I get shivers and chills if I let my imagination run wild thinking about the possibility or even just the irrational fear of what it would be like to wake up in that, in that predicament. It's difficult to imagine anything more horrifying than realizing you've been buried alive and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Let's just say I want my grave digger to check and double check my pulse before they plot me in the ground. Because burying living things alive is barbaric. It's cruel and it's torturous. On the other hand, burying dead things is humane, kind, and decent. Why are you talking about this, Ryan? I'll tell you. If you're baptized without properly repenting, it's equivalent to being spiritually buried alive. Yes, it really is that dramatic and problematic. If you're baptized without repentance, you're just getting wet. It does absolutely nothing for you in terms of salvation. You know, we should make sure the sinful nature has been crucified to death with repentance before stepping in the waters of baptism. Check for a pulse before burial, because to be buried alive creates all kinds of spiritual problems. Pastors, we aren't doing anyone any favors rushing them to baptism if they aren't already dead. Ryan, are you saying that 
we should refuse to baptize people and only baptize people once a month. No, that's not at all what I'm saying. I am saying, though, that we should disciple people and work with people to make sure, and we do this mostly in an altar, to make sure they understand what repentance is, they understand how to repent, and they have actually repented. Why? Because God doesn't resurrect living things. I've noticed a trend in my church and other churches as well. It's pretty easy to convince people they need to be baptized. However, it's difficult convincing people they need to repent and receive the Holy Ghost. I think there's several reasons for this, and one of them is the traditional and cultural acceptance of water baptism. But it goes deeper than just culture. Baptism is the easiest part of the salvation process. Think about it. Only you can repent of your sins. No one else can repent for you. And it's a painful, bloody, messy, tearful, gut-wrenching process. Our flesh doesn't die easily. It doesn't die naturally. And many people avoid genuine repentance altogether. Sadly, this keeps them from ever receiving the Holy Ghost unless they repent at a later time, meaning they just stay buried alive and they're never resurrected. Because God doesn't resurrect living things. God only resurrects crucified hearts that are ready for a new life. So the infilling of the Holy Ghost is something that only God can do for us. The Holy Ghost is our spiritual resurrection. The stone over our tomb rumbles and rolls away as we go from death to new life in Christ. The Spirit of God fills our empty hearts with power presence, and purpose. We surrender and believe we will receive it by faith, but ultimately we don't and we can't fill ourselves with the Holy Ghost. And no human being can give you the Holy Ghost, impart the Holy Ghost to you, or fill you with God's Spirit. That can be a little intimidating for people because receiving the Holy Ghost requires faith and trust in the unseen and the unknown. Most people have not previously surrendered to God in that way, and they aren't exactly sure how to do it. On the other hand, baptism is the easiest part of the gospel because it's simple. It's the one thing someone else can do for you. All you have to do is let someone put you under the water in Jesus' name. However, we could do with some old-fashioned fear of being spiritually buried alive. Let's not rush people to premature burials that will leave them traumatized and unchanged. Otherwise, we're guilty of giving false comforts of pseudo-salvation to people who haven't been crucified with Christ and died to sin. Baptism is powerful and life-changing when done biblically, but it can do more harm than good when done incorrectly. I've created a little gospel graphic. You can find it uh, at my Twitter account, at Rye Frenchie. You can go to uh, the Apostolic Voice Facebook page, or you can go to RyanAFrench.com and look at this article called Buried Alive, and it's, it's in there. You can, you can grab it. You can, uh, you can copy it. You can share it. Uh, I like this graphic because it just presents the gospel in a sim- simplistic way, And it tells us how to be saved according to the Bible, but not in just a two- or three-step process. It kind of gives the whole overview. Unfortunately, many people will tell you how to be saved according to tradition or opinion, but what they describe isn't even close to what the Bible teaches. I think we're often guilty of trying to oversimplify the gospel so people can understand it and accept it easily. We should try to keep the gospel as simple as the Bible presents it, but we must be careful not to bypass vitally important elements of the process, and it is a process. No one can be saved in 15 seconds or less. Anyone who tells you differently is skipping lots of essential things and ignoring their Bible. For example, two things must happen before you can repent of your sin. One, you must have faith that God is and that he is a rewarder of people who diligently seek him. Two, you must realize that you're bound by sin 
and unworthy of God's grace. If you don't have faith that Jesus lived, died, was buried, and resurrected for your sin, nothing else matters. The entire salvation process begins and ends with faith in God. If you think you're basically a good person that doesn't need saving all that badly, the whole process will be meaningless to you because you won't repent properly and you won't receive the Holy Spirit. Sin is a bigger deal than you might think. We all tend to view ourselves as kinder, nicer, more well-meaning, sincere, and good than we actually are. And our day's prevailing philosophy believes that sincerity is like the ultimate golden ticket to heaven. Sincerity is everything. The rule of emotion and feelings has toppled the worship of reason and logic. Essentially, this is humanism, self-worship. I think myself to be good, therefore I must be good. But what if evil feels good to us? Historically, millions of wrongs have been sincerely committed by people who believed they were righteous. Even scarier, what if good things feel wrong to us? This happens all the time. Faithfulness and self-sacrifice are demanding things, and our feelings deceptively convince us that selfishness is virtuous. Of course, none of this takes God by surprise. The Bible warned against the danger of trusting our hearts, our feelings, our emotions centuries ago. Humanity's egotistical affinity towards looking inwards rather than upwards to God is one of many prevailing flaws ingrained in the sinful human condition. Centuries of humanistic philosophy and false religion have resulted in a general indifference towards sin. Oh, yeah, you know, most people consider murder or senseless violence sinful or immoral. Dusty, unused Bibles demonstrate that people aren't consulting Scripture to define sin and illuminate right living. Most sin is viewed like a speed limit, just a good suggestion, and it can be broken just as long as you don't go too far above it. Plus, we keep changing the speed limits all the time, the sin limits, to fit our feelings. Most people don't care about the limits God originally put into place. They're speeding along through life without a care and feeling comfortably self-righteous. Meanwhile, God is grieved and his nail-scarred hands reach for us lovingly. Sin is the focal point of the gospel. Our frail, fallen, finite, sinful human condition required a sacrifice. It required a perfect sacrifice. And since no human being born of Adam's lineage could ever be a perfect, sinless sacrifice, God robed himself in flesh, overshadowed a virgin named Mary, and she miraculously conceived the Messiah, God with us, and called his name Jesus. Because Jesus had no earthly father, the Bible refers to him as the Son of God. Remember, Joseph was Jesus' father in name only, According to DNA, Jesus had none of Joseph's DNA. His father was God. It's biblically false and theologically inaccurate to consider Jesus to be a pre-existing, eternal, co-equal, separate being from God the Father. Jesus was the human manifestation of the Father. Jesus answered Philip's request to see the Father by saying, "'Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father.'" So why are you asking me to show you to him, Philip? That's John 14, 9, the New Living Translation. Our sin, no matter how mild it may seem to our carnal minds, nailed Jesus to the cross. Failure to take our sinfulness seriously is an insult to the suffering of Jesus. Failure to die to our sins is a blatant disregard of the significance of Calvary. Suppose you boil down every page of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. In that case, it's the story of sin separating us from a loving, intimate relationship with God and God's love finding a way to draw us out of sin back into a relationship with him. You see, God's holy perfection isn't compatible with our sinful imperfections, our rebellion. God made a way for us with his blood to be washed clean and sanctified. Sanctified is just a big word for being made holy or the process of becoming holy. Once you're dead and buried, you're ready for resurrection. The only reason we know who Jesus is today is because of his resurrection. It's beautiful that Jesus died for us, 
but miraculously, he conquered death for us. Jesus didn't die for you to die with him and stay buried. God wants to breathe his spirit into your lifeless spiritual body and raise you up with the power to be a new person. His tomb is empty, and yours should be too. If you've been buried in baptism but haven't received the resurrection power of the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues, it's the spiritual equivalent of staying stuck in your tomb. There's a great song by the Christian group Cain called Rise Up Lazarus that says, Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us? Out from the grave like Lazarus. Rise up like Lazarus. Rise up. Out from the grave like Lazarus. He's calling us to walk out of the dark. He's giving us new resurrected hearts. What a powerful anthem reminding us that Jesus is calling us. He's calling you. He's calling me to resurrection power. There's no reason to stay dead when Jesus is offering us new life. The new life Jesus offers is wonderful, powerful, abundant, eternal, joyful, purposeful, hopeful, and supernatural. Once you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, you have the ability, the power, the authority, the desire to walk in the Spirit and not the flesh. You no longer have to be a slave to sin. It's not just that you're freed from the penalty of sin, but you can overcome sin. Old chains of sin and temptation can be broken, and you can access life and liberty in the Spirit. This brings me to a subject that's important, though, and I call it differing definitions. Differing definitions. One of the oddest issues facing our culture is the mishandling of words. Even among Christians, we frequently use the same words, but our definitions differ. Our definitions are different. Two perfect examples are the words freedom and bondage. Many self-professing Christians have accused me and people like me of living in bondage because I live a biblical, holy, separated, consecrated, spirit-led lifestyle. As the Bible teaches, I believe that God saved me from my past sin and calls me to walk in holiness. That doesn't mean I've obtained perfection. He's definitely still working on me. But it does mean I'm actively walking away from bondage rather than living in bondage to sin. This is what the Bible means when it refers to freedom and liberty. When the Bible says things like, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, it's talking about that. However, many Christians ignore the Bible and redefine freedom from sin as the freedom to sin freely without consequences. In other words, according to their way of thinking, the cross gives them the liberty to keep sinning. Do you see the disparity here? We have completely opposite and opposing views of biblical freedom and bondage. Problematically, Christians of all stripes can be using the same language but mean totally different things. So it's vitally important to narrow down and lock in our definitions according to the Bible. Otherwise, we run the risk of saying things without honest communication taking place. Grace and mercy are two other words that people often misuse. Uh, and, and that's another subject for another day. But let's, let's narrow it down and let's look at the gospel, the raw gospel, strictly according to the Bible, removing all lenses of opinion and tradition. Because God knew that defining definitions and homing in on the correct meaning of words would be difficult. Human dishonesty and forgetfulness constantly rearrange connotations. This is precisely the reason God preserved his word for us in written form. God charges us with the responsibility to rightly, correctly divide, accurately handle, and skillfully teach the word of truth. That's 2 Timothy 2.15. So any information regarding how to be saved from sin and eternal judgment can and should only come from the divinely inspired word of the Lord. Anything else is less reliable than a 30-day weather forecast. Most Christians agree with the premise that the gospel must be obeyed according to the Bible. However, many Christians mysteriously misinterpret, add non-biblical elements of tradition, insert opinions, or they just overlook inconvenient sections of Scripture. And this dilutes the gospel into something that is ineffectual. 
Really, it dilutes it into something that is not the gospel at all. The early New Testament church certainly would not have recognized most modern gyrations of the gospel presented in churches claiming to be Christian today. So now I want to summarize the gospel for you. I want to summarize it down as simplistically as I can. And be ready, be aware. I I wrestled with it. I'm going to go ahead and just give you scripture references, even though I know in spoken word, if you're listening, uh, that can be a, a little bit boring and droning, but for those that perhaps might be writing something down. But remember, if you can't write it down and you're interested in finding these references, you can go to ryanafrench.com, look up the article Buried Alive, and uh, each scripture reference is listed there. You can hover your mouse over it, or if you're on an iPad or a phone, you can touch it, and the verse will just pop up. You don't even have to leave the, the web page. Salvation begins by acknowledging you need a Savior and that Jesus is the only risen Savior. John 3.16, John 1.12, Romans 10.9, Romans 3.23. You must have faith in God and believe that His Word is accurate. Hebrews 11.6, Ephesians 2.8 and 9, Ephesians 6.16, 1 Corinthians 2.5. Not only are we sinners, but we were born under the grip and curse of human sin. Romans 5.12, Romans 7, 14, Psalm 51, 5. You must respond to the sorrow you feel over your sin by repenting before God. Repentance is more than I'm sorry. Repentance means to turn around and go the other direction. In other words, repentance is the determination and decision to stop sinning. That's Romans 6, 6, Acts 2, 38, Acts 3, 19, Acts 17, 30. Once you've repented of your sin... You're spiritually and symbolically dead and ready for burial, which is water baptism in Jesus' name. Acts 2.38, Mark 6.16, Acts 22.16, Romans 6.4, Colossians 2.12, Acts 2.41. Again, it's vital to be buried or baptized exactly as the Bible commands. The word baptism literally means to be immersed in something. Just like we wouldn't sprinkle dirt on a dead body and say burial was complete, we wouldn't splash water on a dead sinner and call them buried either. Recently, I saw a video on Facebook of a man being baptized standing in a kiddie pool. This was during COVID, and so they were trying to be careful, I guess, but he was standing in a kiddie pool, and the pastor took two bottles of water and poured the bottles of water over the top of the poor man's head, and then he pronounced him baptized. If it weren't so tragic, it would have been the most hilarious thing I'd ever seen. Because there is so much misinformation surrounding baptism, we need to make three things very clear. One, as already mentioned, you must correctly repent before baptism, otherwise you're being buried alive. Two, you must be wholly completely submersed, immersed, submerged, buried, covered, plunged, however you want to say it, in water for the remission, the washing away of your sin. This is why babies cannot and should not be baptized, because a baby can't understand the gospel and properly repent. So it isn't possible for a baby uh, to, to be baptized properly. And secondly, a baby hasn't reached the age of accountability Three, and this one is probably the most important and most debated subject concerning baptism, the person baptizing you must baptize you calling on the name of Jesus, Acts 2.38, Acts 4.12, Acts 10.48, Acts 22.16, Galatians 3.27. To clarify, the person baptizing you must not call out the titles Father, Son, or Holy Ghost or any other name or title because the titles don't have the saving authority of the name of Jesus. The cleansing power of baptism comes primarily from invoking the name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus. If you've been baptized in a way that is not biblical, you should consider being rebaptized correctly immediately. And we have precedence for this. You can go to Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 5, where Paul rebaptized men who were not baptized according to the New Testament teachings. Once you've died and been buried, you're ready to be resurrected, filled with the Holy Ghost. 
Here's a little secret. If the, if the Spirit doesn't resurrect you, eventually your old flesh will come back to life. In fact, even after you're resurrected, your flesh will keep trying to come back to life. We'll talk about that next. Without the Holy Ghost, you can't access newness of life, and you are not a new person in Christ Jesus. Remember, everything about salvation must be done according to the Bible. And according to the Bible, everyone who receives the Holy Ghost for the very first time will supernaturally speak in tongues, in a language they do not know or understand. Now, I know, and you know, there are many other continuing evidence that a person has been filled with God's Spirit. Speaking in tongues is not the only evidence. Just look at Galatians chapter 5. But speaking in other tongues is always the very first evidence that God requires. You can find that in Acts chapter 2 verse 4, Acts 2 38, Acts 10, 44 through 46, Acts 19, 6, Mark 16, 17, 1 Corinthians 14, 2, Acts 19, 1 through 7. Once you've been resurrected or filled with the Spirit, you're like a newborn baby in the family of God. That's why we often call it being born again, like Jesus did as well, John 3, 3, and then Peter and 1 Peter 1, 3. At this point, your life is just beginning. It's an exciting, abundant, wild, scary, adventurous, joyful, powerful, overcoming life walking in the Spirit. Everything changes once you've been filled with the Spirit. God will rearrange you from the inside out. The Bible calls this process of becoming holy like the Lord sanctification. The Holy Spirit will convict, correct, purify, strengthen, empower, and encourage you daily. No area of your life is off limits to the Spirit. There's nothing the Spirit isn't allowed to change, rearrange, or eject from your life completely. There are countless things the Spirit will add to your life that you couldn't have without the Spirit. This ongoing process of walking in the Spirit is never ending. The gospel really is a never-ending process, or at least we could say it's a process that does not end until either we physically die or we're raptured. The gospel is a process that moves us throughout the entirety of our lives. It's a complete restart, do-over, new beginning. It's a lifelong relationship with God. Count the cost in advance because living for God will cost you everything you have, but it will give you more than you could ever imagine. The gospel isn't just a checklist you complete and then forget about as you move, move through life unchanged. No, the gospel is radically refining, totally transforming, and divinely disrupting. Walking in the Spirit will take you through the valley of the shadow of death and to mountain peaks of triumph. Life in the Spirit is never, ever boring, and the afterlife benefits are without compare. Hey, I know commercial breaks are frustrating, but I do want to pause and let you know you can financially support this apostolic Pentecostal programming by giving as little as 99 cents a month. You can give $4.99 a month or even as much as $9.99 per month by going to www.anchor.fm forward slash apostolic voice forward slash support. Also, please consider giving this podcast five stars and a quick review on iTunes. It really helps us out in the search engines people use to find podcasts when you give us a like and a review. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you for your support. God bless. For those of you who've been listening to the podcast from the beginning, you know I love poetry, write a little poetry, and I've enjoyed featuring different poems here on the podcast from time to time. 
I was thinking about that the other day and listening to some music. Had a long road trip. Uh, the family and I, we we traveled through Mississippi, Jackson, Mississippi, went uh, to Texarkana, Texas, and Nashville, Arkansas. So we spent many, many hours in the car, had a lot of opportunity to listen to some old music uh, from my teenage years. And one particular group that has always been a favorite of mine is the group PFR, an acronym for Pray for Rain. They were popular in the 90s. They broke up, uh, oh, I think 97 or 98, something like that. And uh, this particular song that I'd like to feature, because this song really is just a poem. Most songs are just a poem put to music. This particular song is called Fight from the album Them, 1996. And I think this particular song slash poem fits very nicely with the subject that we've been dealing with, salvation and the gospel. It's written by Joel Henson and Patrick Dennis Andrew, the two main members of Pray for Rain. And so I'm going to read for you now, Fight. She takes the six o'clock train. It's off to work and then home again. She wonders if this will ever change. Clutching her pillow, she hides in a dark room in her heart. How long has it been since love touched her and she let it in? Chased out the shadows, filled emptiness. With her head in her hands, she cries, Come back again, I need you, my friend. We fight on our knees, but don't often see The battles that rage being won. But fight on, we will, and tarry until Love comes to carry us on, To kneel with the broken in spirit And call upon the sun. So many holes here within, torn apart and then blown by the wind. Hell and high water come crashing in. Pride says to fight, but he cannot defend. This means to an end. The truth cuts like a blade, bleeding all of the plans that he made. Nothing but faith in the one who came can ever bring peace to the spirit again. Will he understand? We fight on our knees for those who might see. The battle is over, it's won. Not by our hands, by the Son of Man. He who is has overcome. Death and the grave hold no power to those who call upon the sun. We fight on our knees, but don't often see the battles that rage being won. But fight on, we will, and tarry until love comes to carry us on, to kneel with the broken in spirit and call upon the sun. Sun. 